Hey, everybody, welcome to the Wonderful World of Remnant Radio. In this program, I've got Tim Chafee with us, and we're talking about Nephilim and angels. It's going to be fun. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. We've got Dr. Chafee back with us on the program discussing Nephilim, the sons of God, and this great fall that takes place in Genesis chapter 6. What the heck is going on there? Well, we're going to be talking about it today, and uh, it's going to be a great program for you. But before you dive into the discussion and we learn about Tim and his ministry, I would really encourage you to hit the subscribe button, like the video, and help us share it around, if you would, help us get this content out there. If you want to follow Remnant Radio, one of the best ways to do that is following us on our newsletter. And we come out with study guides. You come out with resource material. We come out with books that you should go pick up. You can find all of that in the newsletter. So go check that out down in the link of the description. One of the things that we're putting together is a full length response to the cessationism documentary uh, that also goes out in the newsletter. So if you're interested in uh, engaging with some of that material, go check it out below. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to, uh, I guess, an odd Monday co-host, Michael Miller, uh, and then we'll introduce Tim as well. Michael, you're subbing in for Michael uh, because he, I think because of Wisconsin. Is that right? Oh, no. I just think I add a new weird element to the show, especially when we're talking about Nephilim. So that's <laughs> probably just, why. He's like, I'm just the weird spirits guy. That's that's it. Um, <laughs> well, glad to have you, Miller. Uh, really excited to dive into our subject today about the, the, the Nephilim uh, and what's going on in Genesis 6. But before we dive into that, Tim, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your ministry? All right, yeah, uh, Tim Chafee, and some people may recognize me from the Ark Encounter or the Creation Museum. That's my full-time job. I'm the content manager there. And uh, since I mentioned that, I should probably also mention that the topic we're going to get into is not one that Answers in Genesis, the parent ministry of those two places, uh, takes an official view on. So what you're going to hear are my own views, not necessarily those of the ministry. Uh, but I also do a side ministry called Risen Ministry. So I do some speaking and writing and um, been doing that for over 20 years. It wasn't always called Risen Ministries, but um, has been for about the last five years. And uh, so I'm a, a, a husband for almost 27 years and um, a father of two kids that are both adults now. My youngest just turned 21 a, a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know how that happened, that it went by so quickly. But um, yeah, I just, I'm very blessed to get to do the things that I get to do. Well, fantastic. Well, well so we're go ahead, Miller. Oh, I'm just kind of curious before we dive into the content. What uh, what got you into this topic? Like, what was, yeah, the, what um, was the fascination here? Well, Josh will remember I got to be in studio with you guys one time mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, and I'm almost six foot nine, and I've been called oh, giant in go. my life. Or um, <laughs> even you know Ken Ham, the the CEO and founder of Answer, his nickname for me is Neffel Tim. And so <laughs> I'm going to call you yeah, Dr. Neffel Tim from now on. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's funny. And, but I've heard that so many times. And when I was doing my, my THM at uh, Liberty back in uh, 2000, I was working on 2010, I needed to do a thesis. And I thought, well, let me see what this is all about. I, I've got an idea already and I've, I've looked at it a little bit, but let me go into detail. Surely somebody else has done that already. And I, tried for a long time to find some scholarly material on the subject and there there wasn't much at all uh, a lot of it out there was just more f f uh, sensationalistic and i and that wasn't what i was interested in I, I what does the bible teach on this topic and uh so that's what i ended up doing my thm thesis on and uh from that was in 2011 and then i wanted to make that available as a, a lay level resource but i knew it had to get a lot longer and that I needed to get rid of a lot of the footnotes. And uh, there were a lot of different things to chase down that I really couldn't get into in an academic paper. And when I was about halfway done with it, that's when Dr. Michael Heiser came up with Unseen Realm. And I thought, oh, stink, somebody beat me to it. And and <laughs> so what's the point of even finishing? And I was able to read through his and I thought, no, actually, there's two different emphases here. Uh, his, if, if people are wondering the difference, um, we'll probably talk about it in some ways, but his is more like a, if people are familiar with this terminology, like a biblical theology on the topic, like moving from the beginning of scripture all the way to the end, what can we know about this topic at this point and how does it 
play into the the biblical narrative. Whereas mine is more like a systematic approach, looking at every single argument that people come up with for one view or the other. You know, he spends about two or three pages on the different perspectives on who the sons of God were. And um, he just, for the, you know, he's right that they're angelic beings. And he just uh, kind of makes that statement and moves on with that assumption. My book, I think the first, uh, much of the first half of the of the book is all about those three views and looking at the arguments for and the arguments against them. Yeah, I also liked how you touched on how the theology of these things interweaves and connects. Uh, one of the things about Michael Heiser, love him, uh, fantastic scholar. You should go check out our interviews that we've had with him. He's recently gone to be with the Lord. If you're watching, you like, don't know who we're talking about. Uh, great guy, great minister. Uh, one of the things that he would do is he would just kind of throw stuff out there and be like, well, this is what the Bible says. I'll let you figure that out. And then he keeps he keep going. And it's like, but wait, <laughs> this statement of like uh, of there being other gods and like, like, how does that affect Christian theology? If there are other Elohim out there, we'll dive into that a little bit later in the show, uh, because we believe there's one triune uh, God, right? That, that has omniscience. He's all powerful, right? He's everywhere. He's he's he is this really all powerful God. And there's these other lesser kind of spiritual beings who take this title Elohim. Uh, but like he would say things and he would use like quotes from Jesus, you know, like, hey, Jesus uses this quote in Psalm 82. And then he just kind of walk away. And I'd be like, but wait a second, like we've been using that verse to explain to Mormons that they aren't going to be gods one day. Like if we change that text, like what does that mean? Like what what are we going to do with it? So I was really appreciative of your work and how systematically you kind of walked through all the little components and how that affected ethics, how that that affected, you know, uh, a theology proper as it pertains to the divine nature of God and other things. So maybe let's just start off at the beginning. Like you said, your first couple of chapters tackle that subject of the different ways of viewing who the Ben Elohim are in Genesis 6. So people are, are tuning in for the first time. Uh, set the stage for us. Genesis 6, what's going on? What are the primary views that people have in interpreting that passage? Yeah, the first four verses talk about how there was a time when the um, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they had they took wives of whomever they chose and they had children with them. And it tells us in verse four that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, whenever the sons of God did this. So you have this, who are the sons of God? That That's where the, the biggest debate is, because if you get that one nailed down, then the Nephilim aren't too difficult, although there's still, there's still going to be some uh, disagreement about that. But um, so the sons of God, uh, historically, there have been three major views uh, throughout the church. The the earliest one that we know about, the most ancient Jewish writings that we have, and the earliest Christian writings we have viewed them as angelic beings who rebelled against God and had uh, offspring with women. Then uh, in about the second early second century, you had some Jewish writers adopt a different view that I, I've called it the royalty. Some people call it divine king's view or uh, divine judges that uh, these men thought that they were, you know, they were kind of viewed as gods, these people who were kings or judges, and therefore their offspring, their sons, could be sons of the gods. You know, this whole idea that maybe there's a parallel in Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern literature about the kings being viewed as deity, that sort of thing. And then, uh, so that would be the next view. Then the third view, and really the view that dominated church history up until about the last uh, century from about Augustine until then is that, no, the sons of God were just godly men from the line of Seth that's described in Genesis chapter five from you get Adam to Seth and then all the way down to Noah. So it's men in that line and they were marrying daughters of men who are women from the line of Cain, which is described in Genesis chapter four. So those are the three primary views that people have held throughout church history. And yeah, so the first half of my book deals with with those So, sorry, I just realized Josh has moved the camera over to me. <laughs> uh, so tell us some of the, uh, uh, why, help us reconcile sons of God with the, Seth, the sons of Seth interpretation. What about that is lacking? Oh, um, what isn't lacking? <laughs> it is yeah. a popular view. So it does have the strength of church history from about the fourth century till last century. But textually, it just doesn't hold up at all. There, there's You have to go from, it, it says that um, it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. Well, who is that? It's all men, obviously, right? Mankind in general. 
uh, having daughters. And then it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Suddenly they want to qualify daughters of men, which were just mentioned in the previous verse. No, this is just daughters from the line of Cain. Um, well, first of all, there are no daughters mentioned in the line of Cain. At least they never use the word daughter. There is one woman named Naama at the very end. Whereas the other line, the line of Seth, mentions sons and daughters every single time. So why would the daughters refer to the different line? Um, why would, where does the Bible ever say these men in the line of Seth were godly? We know that Noah was, and we know that Enoch was, but where does it say the rest of them were? And where does it say all the men in the line of Cain were ungodly? It doesn't say that. That's something that's being imposed on the text. And uh, when you read on to Genesis chapter four, the Nephilim are the offspring of these unions. And there's debate about that, but if, when you break it down, you understand what, what the passage is saying. That's clearly what's being taught there. Why, why would uh, ungodly women marrying godly men produce giants. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and why would God drown the entire earth for something that has continued to happen throughout history? And if these were godly men, why did they keep on marrying ungodly women? I mean, all these things just don't line up from the Sethite view. And how did they get on the earth, the Nephilim get on the earth after the flood if all the Canaanites are gone in the flood? Well, so the why do you think there was this new novel idea in the second century to change that? Uh, so I, th this will kind of go deep. I think, I think we can trace this historically. Um, you had in, after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, um, Judaism and Christianity started to drift further and further apart. You know, a lot of times we think of them as being like two different religions, but early on Christianity was just considered to be like a sect of Judaism. And for, of course, the very first Christians, the first several thousand were Jews. And um, it was started by Jews, the apostles and Jesus himself. So once the temple was destroyed and there's no longer the sacrificial system, the rabbis kind of redefined the Jewish faith. And you can see certain instances of that in the way that Oh boy, this will be controversial. In the way the Masoretic you don't have to get it. Yeah, I knew I knew that's where it was going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Michael is one hundred percent on board with you on this. I am. Yeah, I'm you, dipping my toe into the waters, but go ahead. Yeah, I, you, I've been I've been debating, Josh. Did the Masoretic get slightly tampered with when it came to the Messiah and issues of the Elohim yeah. and the dating and all that? So go ahead. And and also messianic prophecies. There, there are a handful of those that got, so there's there's a few different lines of evidence that show that at about that time, late first century, early second century, um, anything that could be used to demonstrate Jesus as the Messiah or Jesus being divine. So if, you're, if you've got sons of God being divine beings and you're talking about other divinity in heaven, well, that, we can't have that. And so you see remnants of those changes in Deuteronomy 32, especially verse eight and also verse 43. Uh, from the Masoretic. So it's not like the Masoretic was done at that time, but the what's called the Vorlaga or the the text that would eventually become the Masoretic seemed to be, um, uh, I'm going to say altered at that point. Um, and there is considerable <laughs> evidence for that through the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest Hebrew that we have, and also the, the Septuagint, um, the, the Greek translation, which was done before that time. So at the same time, you had three different rabbis uh, threaten with excommunication anybody who would hold the fallen angel view. And uh, so that was something that was very predominant in the Jewish writings of the intertestamental period. And suddenly, if you hold that view, you're excommunicated. Um, uh -oh. So there's something that happened there at that time. And I, I think we can put the pieces together, figure out here's That's Happened. That's really interesting because Second Temple Judaism was rife with angelic conversations and spiritual stuff and like talking about the Nephilim and whether it be mm -hmm. speculation or explicit teaching and writings. Um, so I, maybe we'll circle back to that in a second. But but I also want to talk a little bit, not just about the Sethite view, but that other view, uh, like the, the royalty, royalty view or the kingly view. Uh, could you maybe mm -hmm. unpack some of that for us? Where did it emerge in history? Uh, what's the grounds that it's arguing for? That kind of thing. Yeah, so actually with those three rabbis that I mentioned just now, that's where, as far as we know, that's where it originated. The, they held to this or they promoted this view that they were uh, judges or I think they went with judges to, who were viewed as divine. Israel's judges being uh, called Elohim and therefore, you know, their offspring being the B'nai Elohim. So that's where that originated from. Um, that was actually the second view, even though it, a lot of people today still haven't even heard of it. Um, but some of the problems with it, you know, they base it largely on w the wording in Genesis 6-2 where it says they, they, the sons of God took wives of whomever they chose. 
And so this idea is that these were powerful men who were able to take any women that they wanted and bring them into their harems, that sort of thing. And so their sin was polygamy, and therefore the world's going to get judged for that. But the problem is in Genesis, that that wording, they took wives, that's just marriage. It, it's not saying that they forced them into their harems or anything. Abraham took Keturah, you know, after Sarah died. That's what it says. Isaac took Rebekah as wife. And we know that she was a willing bride. Uh, the, the text comes right out and tells us that. Um, so it's just the an idiom for marriage. And so the, one of their major arguments crumbles just from that point. Um, so there's also the question of whether or not any Israelite judges were ever viewed as being divine. I know some people will interpret uh, Psalm 82 that Psalm 82. way. Yeah, but, but I think there's a much better way to interpret that, as uh, Dr. Heiser showed um, in Unseen Realm. And so that, that's those are kind of the primary arguments that and the the idea that the ancient Near East that kings were viewed as divine, but that is overstated big time. There there are not a lot of um, ancient cultures who viewed their kings as being divine. That's something that uh, is is commonly taught. But when you go back and look at the literature, there are very few uh, cases where that was where they did that. Well, it doesn't. So he also, I remember reading this in, in Unseen Realm by Heiser. He talks about in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, the idea that these were the, the Bnei Elohim here, the sons of Israel. That doesn't make any sense because Israel didn't exist. But then also right. you've got Jude that seems to talk about the Bnei Elohim as, as angels, as divine beings. And then you've also got Daniel speaking about the Prince of Persia and Prince of Greece. Can you comment about some of those? Passages. Yeah, of course, Jude doesn't use the term Bnei Elohim, Jude's writing in Greek, but he does talk about angels who left their proper abode, and then it's in the context of sexual immorality and that kind of thing. So it, it seems to it seems very clear that's what he's referring to. And uh, of course, it lines up pretty closely with 2 Peter 2, 4, which does the same sort of thing, um, and 1 Peter 3, uh, 18 through 20. So you have those three passages in the New Testament that, that seem to very strongly be implying the uh, fallen angel view. Um, Sorry, what was the other part of your question? The... Well, I'm just kind of curious. I mentioned the Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. about who the Bnei Elohim are there. You already mentioned Second Peter 2. I was going to bring that one up as well. It seems to be like these Genesis 6 sons of God were the false teachers as well. Um, th this couldn't have just been uh, normal human beings. It had to be some sort of like secret teachings. And isn't the Deuteronomy 18 passage kind of talking about the practices that were given by them? Uh, it seems to be. Deuteronomy 32, yeah, you talked about how, verse 8 and 9, it talks about how the nations were divided at Babel uh, according to the number of the sons of the Masoretic, says Israel, the ancient text we have, the two of them from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then the, say, Bnei Elohim, and then the uh, Septuagint has always said the uh, angels of God. So that's how it was viewed then. Um, and so if you go back to Babel, when you read through Genesis chapter 10, and you look at how the nations were divided or the people, there were 70 of them. Well, how do you get 70 from 12 sons of Israel who didn't even exist yet? So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the, it, it, the original wording was very clearly uh, Bnei Elohim there. So they were divided according to the number of the sons of God. It seems as if God said, look, you don't want me as your as your God, you, I told you to do this and you're rebelling. So now I'm going to turn you over to, um, to these, to these entities and they're going to get to rule you. So I think that that's what Heiser referred to as disinheriting the nation at Babel. And I, I think he's right on that. So let's, uh, as a systematic theology guy, let's, let's look at this concept of Elohim. Like how is that phrase used throughout the scriptures as it relates to beings that are not God, because we know the Elohim is used of God, uh, proper, uh, the, the one yeah, triune God that we all worship, but then is also used of other entities as well. Can you maybe unpack that for us? Yeah. So like you said, used of God, obviously in the beginning, you know, uh, Elohim is how is God in the very first verse of the Bible. And about 90% of the time out of 2000 times that it's used roughly 2000 times, it's referring to the, the all powerful creator God, uh, the God of the Bible. But it is also used to talk about pagan deities. So you shall have no other Elohim before me in the Ten Commandments. Obviously, these are uh, the, the gods of the nations. It, it refers, it uses that terminology to talk about them as Elohim. Uh, in Psalm 8, it says, You have made him a little lower than the Elohim, than the angels. Um, so there's debate about how that should be translated. I think the New American Standard says, You have made him a little lower than God. 
Um, but in Hebrews, you have the quote of that, and the, the Septuagint had always said, lower than the angels. Uh, so angels are referred to as Elohim. Uh, the gods, the fallen angel, the rebellious angels, they're referred to as Elohim. And another place where you see that is in 1 Samuel 28, where um, Saul goes to the uh, medium at Endor and asks her to call up this spirit or call up Samuel. And it tells us that, you know, Samuel appeared. It tells us four times that this spirit that appeared was Samuel. Um, he's called an Elohim. I see an Elohim ascending uh, from the earth. And so what the term seems to be referring to are entities that are from the spiritual realm, if you will, that that's their proper uh, place or that's where, where they normally are is in the, the spiritual realm. It isn't just a term to refer to God. So when you're saying that the Elohim represent a number of different spiritual beings, the departed Samuel, uh, when he comes back from, from the dead, uh, idols that people worship, and then these angels, uh, uh, perhaps principalities, the Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece. And then what's also mentioned in Psalm 82 is the B'nai Elohim there, that they'll be judged just like wicked men. Um, help me connect something here, though. If 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 the the Elohim, uh, if the word Elohim is just a, a generic term for gods or even departed people, um, what do we do with the passage where we're, t we're talking about sacrificing animals to gods or sacrificing beings to gods, and yet there's only one God. Uh, how do we square up monotheism with this idea that there are other gods? Yeah, I, I think when we say that there is, when we're talking about theism or monotheism, we're talking about one all-powerful creator God who's eternal, um, and he created all things. So these other entities that are called gods, lowercase g, if you will, um, they are not eternal. They are not all-powerful. They uh, Typically, what most Christians in the West would just refer to as angels, uh, although it might be just a special class of angels, a certain category. Uh, but if you think of them as just heavenly beings, rather than if the term gods um, is upsetting to you, then just think of them as being a, a, a class of angelic beings. And I think, the, or just and heavenly beings, if you will. Um, so I, I think we have to expand our, our thinking about the heavenly realm, if you read through scripture, you ver you have a diversity of angelic life. You have the the uh, cherubim and the seraphim. You have description of certain ones that are very different. I think we're going to all be very surprised at how different things appear when we're with the Lord. <laughs> there are a lot of different types of spiritual beings. So uh, unpack that for me. You I mean, you're talking about these different spiritual beings. Um, Elohim to Ben Elohim, make that connection for me, and then maybe yep. unpack some of Psalm 82, since we've kind of touched on it, quoted on it a little bit. Um, there are other Elohim, it seems, uh, but what are Ben -A Elohim or Ben Elohim, depending on yeah. my, your sure. emphasis on the syllable? <laughs> yeah, so I think one thing to keep in mind is the when you look at how Genesis refers to um, men, so in, in Genesis 11, it says God came down to see what the sons of men were doing at Babel, you know, when they were building it. So they're called sons of Adam, sons of the earth. Essentially, God has given the earth to man, but he rules in heaven, as uh, Psalm 116 tells us. Um, so essentially what Elohim is referring to is the the heavenly realm. So the, the sons of the heavenly realm, if you were, will. So beings from the heavenly realm came down and were mixing with the daughters of men. Uh, so the term son, bene or sons is bene, that's the plural, is we often think of it like a biological, um, you know, my, I have my son, therefore that, that's the only way that relationship, father, son, biological. Um, and maybe we think of it as adoptive as well sometimes, but it, the that's not how it's always used in Hebrew. So you have in uh, what is it, First Samuel, where over and over again it talks about the school of the prophets or the sons of the prophets, and the, so there's this group of of people, and in, I think it's also in uh, Second Kings where you have that, where the they're called the sons of the prophets. Well, they're not the necessarily the biological children of prophets. It's just this school of prophets. So it's the the people from that group. That you, if you will. So, um, in one other place that we didn't mention where that term is used clearly to refer to angelic beings is in um, Daniel 3. And this is 
part of the Bible is written in Aramaic, about half of the book of Daniel is Aramaic. And when you got the fiery furnace and you got the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown in there, uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees a fourth man in there, and he uh, had the appearance of a Bar Elohim, which is the Aramaic equivalent of B'nai Elohim. And three verses later, that's verse 25, three verses later, he says, God, you know, Daniel's God, or your God sent his angel. And so uh, right there, you have that terminology connected to angelic beings as well. Well, so then we've also got uh, Psalm 82 that uses it, right? Uh, God takes a stand in the midst of the gods, and then he starts to ask a series of rhetorical questions. Now, mm -hmm. you mentioned how rabbinic Judaism, after the first, second century, they would say that this was referring to judges, human judges. Uh, explain to us why that can't be the case in Psalm 82. Yeah, it would. If all you had was Psalm eighty-two, perhaps you could try to make a case for that. It would be the only place where you have judges very clearly being referred to as Elohim. There are a couple of disputed passages in uh, Exodus where uh, people are supposed to bring the offending person before the Lord, or you're supposed to make an oath before Elohim. And some people say, "Oh, before the judges." Well, actually, you're just making it before the Lord. But um. In John chapter 10, when Jesus quotes that passage, you know, he's arguing with some of the Jews there in, in Jerusalem, and he quotes that passage, I said, you are gods. And right then, of course, they want to they want to stone him. And for what they said is blasphemy, because he had just said, I and the Father are one in, in uh, John 10, 30. And then a few verses later, he goes and quotes this passage. And a lot of times, the, the standard interpretation, the idea that this is referring to Israelite judges or other important people in Israel's history doesn't make any sense because Jesus isn't backing. He's not backing down. He just said, I am equal to the father. And then they want to stone him. He's not saying, Oh guys, you misunderstood me. I am not, I'm not equal to the father. I'm just another important dude. Like the people in the old Testament, you know, that you don't have a problem calling God. No, he's doubling down and he's quoting Psalm 82 and they knew exactly what he was doing. He was claiming to be divine. So maybe, so there's Maybe unpack that a little bit in the for context me. too. Yeah, I want to. I want to know, like, because because the Mormons will grab that verse Psalm eighty two, and they'll be like, "Oh, see, he says that we're gods," and then he's kind of like saying, "And you guys are gods too." Like, unpack that for me because I there, there's a couple things that are in danger in when we read Psalm eighty two in the quotations of Jesus in the New Testament, um, because one, it seems as if he's making himself equal to angels, and that would seem silly hebrews says he's greater than the angels right and jesus is the creator of the angels he's the the host of the angel armies right so like jesus is in, more important to them so how, how why is he comparing himself to them and then also you know, it seems as if he says doesn't it say of you that that you are right like he, he points it over to his audience as if it's no big deal your prophets write this kind of way too uh talking about these other uh b'nai elohim can you maybe unpack why jesus is quoting it and how it doesn't make Jesus great, uh, lesser than uh, the angels or equal to the angels, you know, deflating some of his divinity. And it also isn't uh, endorsing humans as if we are, uh, in fact, somehow divine on that same caliber. Yeah, so I was looking down because I wanted to pull it up on my phone. I didn't want to try to do it all from memory. Um, yeah, so he says, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. So he's, he's not necessarily saying that, that they are gods, that the people he's talking to. He's saying, isn't it written? in scripture that you are gods if he called them gods to whom the word of god came and scripture cannot be broken do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world you are blaspheming so I, I think you'll have different interpretations of that passage in terms of what is he when he says to whom the word of god came but if you look throughout the new testament there's several places hebrews talks about it um where the the the, the law was given through the mediation of angels and you have that that sort of uh, description multiple times in the New Testament and in the Septuagint. And it's something that um, I think sometimes we overlook. We think that it was just directly from God to Moses and that was it. But uh, you have multiple passages talking about it to angels. So I think that, again, is what is probably what Jesus is referring to there. Um, so that's to whom the word of God came. He's not referring to uh, humans um, in, in that perspective. In, in that particular verse. Um, so he is clearly quoting from Psalm 82. And in that Psalm, that's where Elohim, the, the one true God, is in the midst of the other Elohim, the his council, the gods around him. And there he is making these 
strong statements about how they had failed in their charge that they were given to rule justly and to uh, care for the oppressed and they weren't doing it. And then he says that they're going to die like a, like men. Well, if they're men, of course, they're going to die like men. That's what men do. Um, and they're going to fall like one of the princes. And that's right before that. He said, I said, you are gods. And nevertheless, you're going to die like men. And then what I think is really interesting in verse eight there is that's where it ends with arise, O Lord, and judge you, for you shall inherit all nations. So remember back in at Babel, he disinherits the nations. At Deuteronomy 32, 8, it's referring to that, that God gets Jacob, Israel is his portion, but the rest of the nations go to the sons of God. But at some point, when he judges these other entities, he gets all nations. Well, so, okay, some... so I had those two questions. I want to circle back around to that. So one, you, you totally nailed it, right? Like, so humans are not these divine agents, but how does this not make Jesus equal to those other agents? Does Isn't he superior? And how, how do we avoid that reading of, of Psalm 82? Are, are you saying it's because he is the Elohim that sits enthroned amongst the other Elohim? Is that the way yes. that we are to take that? That's how I look. I mean, he's just said right before that, I and the Father are one, you know, in just gotcha. previous to that. And then, um, and so I think what they're objecting to, because he says, which of the good works are you trying to stone me for? And it's not for a good work, but because you being a man, make yourself God. And then that's when he, he doubles down on things. He doesn't backpedal at this point. Fantastic. So in Psalm 82, though, there's also some elaboration there that makes it pretty hard to believe that these could be merely human judges. And he mentions the foundations of the earth are shaken. It's like right. they've got this job to do, right? And they're supposed to, what, what exactly would you say, if they're going to die like mere mortals because they failed at this job, what is the job that they're doing? What are their responsibilities? Well, I think, so it says um, in verse two, this is where God says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? So he's, he's asking them how long they're going to do that. But then I think he goes on and says in verse three, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and destitute, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. If God put them in charge over the nations that scattered from Babel, they're supposed to be leading them and guiding them into truth. And instead they're leading them in all sorts of pagan religion and, um, you know, hedonism and all sorts of other things that the nations were being judged for. So they're clearly not doing what they were supposed to do. And, and you're right. When he says, because of this sin or this fault, all the, the foundations of the earth are shaken. Is that because a couple of judges in Israel didn't do what they were supposed to do? And no, it's because these spiritual beings were failing at their role. Do you think that it's actually talking about earthquakes, natural disaster, those kind of things? Like, are, are, Is there a, a chance that certain weather phenomenon and things like that are under the domain of these particular beings and they've failed at this job and in fact are killing people? Uh, I think that's within the realm of possibility. I, I, it is a, a psalm with poetic language, so you're going to get a lot of metaphor. And so I, I would tend to think that's what's being talked about there, that it's more of just it's led to disastrous consequences for the, for the nations, for the people of the world that you're supposed to be doing. But um, I, I don't think we could rule out the, the possibility that they also can affect the, the physical realm that way. Tim. Tell me about the idea of these beings, these Ben Elohim, being made in the image of God. Um, I remember the first time I heard this, didn't love it because of the way it was being used in Genesis, like, let us make man in our image. And I was like, ooh, don't like that. Uh, I, maybe maybe you can make it more palatable for me, uh, or, or, or maybe debunk it. Like, I'd love to know what your thoughts are on the image-bearing-ness of these Ben Elohim. Yeah, so that's a good, a good question, and it's one that would be controversial. Um, the when you ask people what does it mean to be, be made in God's image, a lot of times people will you'll get you ask four different people, you get five opinions, right? Um, so usually we talk about different attributes. We uh, we can communicate with God or commune with Him. We um, will live eternally. We are given the right to rule or dominion. Um, we are creative. We so we're we're like God in those ways. Of course, we're not. Uh, you know, unlimited like he is. We're not all powerful like he is, but he has created us in that way. But everything that you can think of in that in that list, angels are too. Um, so when he says in 
certain passages like first Kings 22, that's where Micaiah, the prophet has this vision of God's throne room. And, um, in Isaiah six, who will go for us and whom shall I send? Who is he speaking to there? Whether you have the heavenly host all around him and he's speaking to them who will go for us and whom shall I send? So he's the one in charge. He's the one who makes the decisions. And yet he allows input like he, like you see in first Kings 22, when he asks, who's going to go to down and persuade Ahab, to, to go to battle that he may fall at remote Gilead. Um, so you have uh, God asking for their, their thoughts, their, you know, asking them to participate. And yet he's the one who makes the call. He's the one who decides what's going to happen. It's not like he needs their help, but he asks for it. And the same way with us, he doesn't need us to spread the gospel, but he cho has chosen to do it that way. And um, so when you look at, uh, you see the same sort of wording, uh, in Genesis 11, let us go down there and confuse their language. And then you have the same sort of wording in Genesis chapter 1, verses 21, 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image uh, according to our likeness. And then it says, then God made man. So he's the one who acts. He's the one who does it. And there's debate about whether or not that passage is including the angelic realm at that point, or the divine council, if you will. Uh, some people just see that as tr inner Trinitarian dialogue. Um, and, uh, you know, that, uh, clearly that would not be heretical if that's what's going on there. Um, but some people might view the other, the alternative as heretical. Like, oh, how could you possibly be saying that angels were involved? Well, because God involves them in decision making a lot of times, and he's still the one who did it, verse 27 says. So it's not saying that angels created men. It's just if God says, let us make man in our image. If that happens to include, if the hour and us happens to include angelic beings, then you would have a clear statement that they're made in God's image. Otherwise, it was more by inference based on what their um, capabilities are and what the image in, image of God entails. Do we have an explicit verse that says that they're made in the image of God, or are we going off of theological inference that if image bearing means co-laboring, if image bearing means communion, if image bearing means a kind of worship that transcends, you know, animalistic order, um, like if it means though, is it is it an inference of theology to say because image bearer means this kind of class of being an angel fits within that class of being therefore it's image bearing is that is that where we're going with it or do we have a specific verse it, it, i think the only verse that you could say would be specific is if genesis 1 26 27 includes the angelic, the angelic. If, okay. uh, yeah if it doesn't then it's more theological inference gotcha yeah i remember michael heiser saying something along the lines of uh in Genesis 1, 26 through 27, if it's referring to the angelic beings, well, one, he was saying there's no way that you could know that it's the Trinity, right? There's no, there's no, that language isn't being used and, and the un unfolding of that revelation is slowly happening throughout that time period. Uh, you don't, it only is fully understood when Jesus comes. But then secondarily, him saying, let us make man in our image is not necessarily saying that the angels themselves are participating in the creation of Adam and Eve. Uh, but rather, it's like me and Josh and Michael Roundtree hanging out at a conference saying, hey, let's order a pizza, but I'm the one who gets on the phone and makes the call. Um, yep. it, it really is, is an inclusion in the sense that what we're, what's being made is going to be something that reflects all of us. Um, so I can see how that could be the case. I guess uh, something I'm kind of curious about is you mentioned earlier the Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, the son, in accordance with the number of the sons of God. And that number mm -hmm. seems to be 70. Um, yeah. And there seems to be a lot of like other references, Ugaritic, uh, other biblical reference to the number 70. 70 seems to hold a lot of significance. Can you dive into some of that? Yeah, you mentioned the Ugaritic text, which of course is not scripture, but the Ugaritic people were the, the you know, Canaanite people who um, they had their, they had their chief god El and then the the 70 sons of El, the Ben Il is what that word. It's almost the same as Bene Elohim. So it's a cognate language, very similar. Um, you had in uh, Israelite history the you know, when um, Moses was having a tough time choosing or judging the people and everybody's bringing their concerns to him, his father-in-law says, hey, pick 70, you know, men who are qualified to do this and let them help you and handle the easy cases. So you have uh, 70 people who handle that with, and the tough cases come to Moses, which eventually the great Sanhedrin seems to be based on that as well. So they had uh, 70 representatives with the high priest ruling over that. Um, so that, that 70 with one at the head seems to be 
um, carried like the out. Septuagint. Well, what's that? Well, you could also make a case that the Septuagint was done by seventy of uh, oh. Israel's elders that were in. Uh, yeah, that was the tradition from like, where of Aristius or something like that. That's the tradition. Yeah, that it was. Uh, which it probably was done by 70 elders, but not in 70 days with all them producing an exact. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that where the yeah, they're all in caves to produce the same thing. Uh, but the yeah. idea that there was 70, it's why it's called the Septuagint. And then you've got yeah. some New Testament references as well. Yeah, so it just does. It does seem to be a, a, a key number. And is that does that mean that's it does it come from that or is it just another area of consistency that um it does seem likely especially since when you do total up the number of uh, of figures of people who leave babel it's not every single name in genesis 10 but it's the ones who are at if you could call them like the the end of the line each time they're 70. um so it does seem as if that's how many are being divvied up at babel okay well, i've got questions because the, this program is entitled The Sons of God and the Nephilim. We've barely scratched the surface on the Nephilim, and we've almost hit the hour mark, so that stinks. Okay. Um, let, let's talk about Genesis 6. I'm like flipping there right now because there's wording in Genesis 6 that seems to suggest that maybe, like let's just go ahead and take the thesis that Ben Elohim are angels. They're not sons of Seth. They're not rulers. These are traditions that have uh, you know, peaked after Jesus uh, during the Masoretic text. These kinds of things are they're trying to scrub Ben Elohim language from uh, interpretation here. Uh, but it talks about all these these great men. Genesis six, uh, right? The daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took uh, their wives. Uh, any as they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide with them forever. Uh, his days shall be on in 20 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So if I take that passage, it could be, it could be read in such a way where I go, the, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> this is a, a modern day prophecy that we don't necessarily take stock in. So, but just hear me out here. Uh, uh, the day that the uh, revival will break out in America, the day that the Kansas City uh, city Chiefs win the Super Bowl. Okay, that's that's the now. Is it saying that when the, the Kansas City Chiefs winning the Super Bowl um, is the event that starts revival, or is it just saying that these two events will happen around the same time period? So, like, you could read Genesis six and go, "Oh, okay. So, when did these angelic beings come down and have relationships with women? Well, it happened to be around the time where there was this genetic anomaly and giants started living in those days. So, could you maybe like weigh in on this? Is this just a time marker, or do we have textual? proof uh, extra biblical proof like what's what's the evidence that these nephilim are actually the offspring of humans and angels so you stopped one word early in that verse the i nephilim did it on purpose i did it on purpose i was trying to make the case for the other people i did yeah. <laughs> yeah um so yes if you read it that way the nephilim if you some people think oh they were already on the earth when this happened because most of our english bibles translate that next word the hebrew word is asher uh, they translate that as when. So the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God did this. And so when you read it that way, it's like, oh, the Nephilim were already there. Well, who are they? I don't know. They're just this group of people. And it's very ambiguous about what the passage is even saying. But if you look at our Hebrew grammars that we have, um, they will say in this in this passage and in others where the word asher is used in this way in conjunction with with the other words there it means whenever it refers to an action that was that occurred in the past and at regular or in, irregular intervals after that so if i said hey um each i think the example i used in my book was something like this um uh, i buy milk when i go to the store okay well does that mean every time or just once in a while if i say i buy bought milk whenever I go to the store now you know it's every single time i go and it, it's when i do this or um so it's it it clarifies what's being said there and i don't think i got that example exactly right but uh, something to that effect but it clarifies that the nephilim were the offspring because they were on the earth whenever the sons of god did this with the daughters of of men and it also clarifies the in those days and also afterward because moses is writing that passage um he knows the spies have gone into the promised land and they come back and report seeing the anakim um, and it's not just them lying about it. The, the narrator, Moses himself, tells us that they, he names That's three of them. That's a good connection. Yeah. And so here he is saying the Nephilim were on the earth in those days before the flood. And also afterward, you know, right now in my time. Um, and it happened. they were there whenever the sons of God did this. And in fact, the, the fallen angel view is the only one that can account for them being there before the flood and also after the flood. 
I want to also show there's some early church history, well, actually early Jewish history as well, that, that seems to corroborate this, right? You, you mentioned in your book uh, about Philo, Josephus, and uh, early Christians. What did they have to say about this view? So, as I mentioned before, the early Jewish writing, so anything intertestamental period, any, and there are a lot of writing. So you have like the Book of Jubilees and the Book of Enoch. And uh, by the way, that's the first time I mentioned Enoch. A lot of times I hear criticism of the following angel view. Oh, it's all based on Enoch. We've been talking for 45 minutes. And it's the first time I mentioned it um, because it's not based on that. But you have like the Testament of Naphtali and a whole bunch of other writings. Anything that touched on this topic, it was a fallen angel view. Uh, in early Judaism, early Jewish writings. And then as far as we know, in the, the early church history for the first couple of centuries, it was all a uh, fallen angel view. Anybody that wrote about it and talked about it, that was the, the view until uh, late third century and then into the fourth century when things started to shift. So uh, yeah, that was the, the dominant view among early Jewish and Christian writers. Tell me the the perspective of like the Antinician fathers, like the about specifically about the Nephilim uh, and the sons of God, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria. Uh, what was their concept of this divine council worldview? How do they process through this? Yeah, so I've got a chart. Um, here we go. Here's the book, by the way, Fallen. Um, but there's a chart in the Appendix E where it goes through all of these people throughout church history from you know, ancient times up until the present and what their view was. So you can kind of track it. You have all the way up through, um, as far as Christian writers go, it is all the way up till Julius Africanus who held a the fallen angel view. And so in the third century, he's the first guy to promote something different. Um, so they, they all held to the idea that angels or, or watchers, they're also referred to like in, uh, borrowed from the, the wording of Daniel, um, that came down and had illicit relationships with women and produced offspring and that's they were the nephilim so just like i'm talking about now as far as the view now they did have and we talked about this before the show a little bit they had a a view that the evil spirits that are seen in the new testament that jesus is casting out these spirits they thought that the um that those evil spirits were the departed spirits of the nephilim who were drowned in the flood so that was a common view uh, among those writers and it's something that's what, becoming why is that where do they get that in scripture um they don't no i'm just kidding i i have a whole chapter about that no, there are many people today who hold that view and um, i think dr heiser favored that without ever really just coming down and saying this is his own view he just said this was what they believed um let's see and uh, doug van dorn has written a book called giants and um he does a pretty good job laying out the case for that uh, you know the passage where jesus talks about when a, a evil spirit is cast out of man uh it goes around and it talks about in he talked about in arid places which is a little weird why would they go around in arid places dry places and then if it comes back like if the guy hasn't cleaned his house essentially essentially gotten his life cleaned up and um, it comes back with seven more stronger than himself. So why arid places? And uh, so certain connections with passages in Isaiah talking about certain uh, creatures that seem to be connected to demonic things. Um, so there are there are several connections that they make and say, well, that, that's these evil spirits needed to have a body. They, they, it seems like they always have to be in something. So when Jesus cast the demons out of the, you know, cast legion out of this, these guys, they, they go into the swine. So it seems like they always want to have a body. So those are the arguments so I, I'm not fully persuaded by that. I I'm open to it, but I, I, I tend to think that the evil spirits in the new Testament are just fallen angels, but I am open so to the other view. That seems rather inferential rather than uh, literally coming from the scriptures. So you're saying there's not like an explicit text of scripture that says um, that the departed Nephilim, both whether it be pre-flood or after the flood, that those would be the unclean or uh, evil spirits that are in the New Testament that Jesus is casting out of people. There's not an explicit verse of scripture that says that. No, there's nothing definitive on that topic. I, and it's not like I covered every single reference that they would they would talk about, but that's the gist of it. So yeah, it's, it's more of inference, like you said. So and that's I, why I, that's why I wasn't fully persuaded by it. 
Yeah, and I think I think we should uh, speak confidently where the Bible speaks confidently and remain silent where the Bible's silent. So if like, yeah. hey, this verse here says Elohim is Elohim, and we see a clear pattern of Nephilim being the offspring of, of human and angelic beings. Okay, so I see that pattern that's there. Uh, but these disembodied spirits, these other demons, these lower level spirits that we see roaming the earth, we don't really... Um, have an explicit origin stories from these creatures. And the Bible's given us everything we need for a life of godliness. It's sufficient in that regard. So if it's not clear, we don't have to, we don't have to teach authoritatively on that. And I, I appreciate that kind of posture um, that we can speculate and think and, and have fun with some of those theological discussions, but trying to figure I'm that out. Okay. I'm okay with some gray area. Some people that want everything black and white. And I'm okay with just saying, you know what? I, I don't know. I, because I'm I don't with think you. the Bible giving That's us good. enough information on that so yeah tell, tell me how we like how does this affect our theology our practice our actual orthopraxy when it comes to okay there are these um uh ben elohim spiritual beings in the heavenly places the bible says there's principalities and powers and rulers like so there there seems to be a hierarchy of these things um and, and we're not supposed to wrestle against flesh and blood but some kind of force in the heavenly places right so like what do we how do we as christians um live out this worldview and this isn't just a theological thing that we just add to our theological quiver what are we supposed to do with this knowledge well i mean you have to agree with me to be saved obviously you got to think that obviously <laughs> <laughs> so that, obviously joking the um that is it, this issue is not a matter of salvation and i've heard people you know there have been people who have said i'm gonna burn because of this view and i just thought that that's a little harsh uh, because I don't think that uh, salvation is contingent upon your understanding of the sons of God and the Nephilim. It's a contingent upon faith in Jesus Christ and um, and his, cru his crucifixion and resurrection. So clearly it is not a salvific issue. Um, but I think it is important for several reasons. One, it, it it's in scripture. God gave us his word for a reason. He wants us to study it and know it. And even the weird passages or the uncomfortable passages, they're, they are there for a reason. I think that we should study them and, and see what it says. And even if we don't like the conclusions, so what? Uh, I, I read the news and I see what happened in Israel a couple of weeks ago. I don't like it, but I don't have to like, I don't, have, I don't get to deny it just because it's uncomfortable. Um, and you can do that with a whole host of sad or terrible news items. But um, so I think it's important for that reason. It's important because like you talked about, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these spiritual powers, it's a reminder that we're in a spiritual battle. I think in the West, we often ignore that or neglect it because it's uncomfortable. And um, you guys have probably seen it because, you know, you talked about the the debate with cessationism and that sort of thing. So I, uh, where, where you're coming from, you probably have, a you know, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, people who are more on the charismatic side, they think way too much about the spiritual realm. And, and so people who aren't, they try to, they go too far in the other direction and almost act mm -hmm. as if it doesn't, that, that realm doesn't exist. And, and it clearly does. The Bible is full of that. Um, but I, I think another reason, and this is one that people can explore. I've got a, a, a chapter that deals with it. It helps account for the severity of the flood and for the severity of the conquest. And if you read through that carefully in the conquest, the places, many places where God said, kill them all, men, women, and children, animals, it's where the giants were. And other places he said, the nations that are far from you, you can you can make an offer of peace to them. That's what he told Moses. Um, and so it helps us understand that th these attacks on God's character that come from the skeptics who say, you know, God is cruel or he's unjust or he's mean, they don't understand the severity of what was going on there. And I think when we avoid this topic, we don't understand it either. Mm, that's good. I, I, I'm I'm curious on on this subject when it comes to um, engaging in warfare and those kinds of things. Heiser's got a bit on preaching the gospel, and he he pulls in. I think it's Luke 11 where he sends out the 70. Um, disciples or the 72 also textual variant which is fun um, mm -hmm. that seems to match for some reason the uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the textual variant right uh, uh, in the mm -hmm. Old Testament so 
that, that account, and then he references John, or John, Revelation chapter 12. He references the Apostle John writing Revelation 12, uh, you know, uh, that Satan is cast down, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. And the way that we wrestle against these kinds of principalities and powers, these spiritual entities, is through preaching a gospel message so that, like, we know, okay, there are these entities up there. And just to reference the hyper charismatics you mentioned a moment ago, you know, there's a, there's a desire to command and decree against these principalities when there's no text of scripture of Moses. Moses, the prophets, the apostles, Jesus himself, they don't just like command and decree these principalities to do things. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, they go out and they preach the gospel and they proclaim the good news of, of who Jesus is, his death, burial, and resurrection. And this somehow pushes back those forces of darkness. Would you would you kind of come into agreement with that kind of uh, takeaway when it comes to engaging with these things? Uh, yeah, largely. I mean, I, I don't think that that passage in Revelation 12 about Satan being cast out of my own eschatology, I don't think that has happened yet. I think he still has access to um, the heavenly realm. At some point, he will be cast down. I, I think that's going to be something in the future. But other than that, yeah, they overcame him by the by the word of his power. You think about Jude, where it talks about with um, uh, Michael contending with Satan over the body of Moses, that really weird passage. He, he just says, the Lord rebuke you. Um, so it's not you know, commanding Satan to flee and doing all those things that the Bible tells us resist the devil and he will flee. Um, so yeah, sharing the gospel is what we're commanded to do. And that is, and uh, you know, you have Ephesians, you take up the full armor of God and he tells us, you know, the, the spiritual armor in a sense, here's how you are able to, um, to fend off the attacks of the evil one. And uh, so that's, that's what we need to be doing is being, is spending time in scripture and sharing the gospel. I'd imagine this would also affect your theodicy on some level as well. Like when you think of the Daniel uh, passage with the uh, the being upheld by the prince of Persia and prince of Greece. Mm-hmm. So Daniel's you know fasting and praying, and apparently there was an angel dispatched the day he began to pray for an interpretation of a dream, yep. and yet it was upheld. So sometimes maybe well, even when it comes days. to yes. Yeah, yeah. So three weeks, we've got a delay in God's answered prayer. Is it possible that that this is true for us today, that when it comes to things we pray for, delays, certain problems we have, certain evils we experience in life and suffering, that all of this could go right back to that, that this is not on God's end, but on the demonic side? Yeah, I think so. Obviously, God accounts for that and knows that, that that was going to happen. But yeah, I think think there's still is a spiritual battle it may not be the same way that frank peretti showed it, even though that was pretty cool in this present darkness but i don't yeah. think that they're up there i remember those books it'd, yeah it'd be pretty awesome if it was always like, the ivy league care. schools <laughs> <laughs> that's right i'll tell you what my prayer life got better each time i read that but um, <laughs> but um yeah i think that's very possible I, I know some people think that you know since the time of the crucifixion and resurrection you know these spirits are bound and they can't really deceive the nation i i, I see peter writing that Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking who, whom he may devour, you know, after that time. So I, I think that's still going on. And I, I think that you still have um, a, a lot of darkness and spiritual darkness in the, this world, because I think the evil spirits are still very active. Bonus question wasn't in our notes. I'm, feel free to say I don't want to weigh in, uh, but I'm really excited about this thought. As in the days of Noah, so will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, does that mean that Nephilim are coming down to the earth? And the bonus question on the tail end of that is aliens. Is that is that the <laughs> lights in the sky? Weigh in, Tim. <laughs> I know you wanted to talk about this. You're a scholar. You're an intelligent man. You want to speculate yeah. about lights in the sky. I know that's what you want to do. Sure. Of course. How did you know? Um, <laughs> so I would say, first of all, no, it does not. It, his wording in Matthew 24, there does not mean that everything that was happening in Noah's day has to be just like that in the uh, just before Jesus returns. He, he's talking about the immediacy, the suddenness of his return, because it talks about how the people did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Uh, similarly, people are going to be taken by surprise. They're going to be going about their daily business. You know, they're uh, marrying and giving a marriage, eating and drinking, all those things like they were before the flood. They're not paying attention to the signs of the times. And that, you know, that's that kind of marking the world just prior to Jesus's return. So I think that's what he's stressing there. He's not saying, Hey, remember there was something about marriage in Genesis six. There's, and I'm mentioning marriage here, so you you you, you should understand we're talking about the the Nephilim. I, I don't think that you can make that strong a connection. I'm not. I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't think you can make a strong case from Scripture that that's what he's talking about. Um, I do have a chapter in, toward the end of the book. Uh, it's like the last chapter, I think, before the appendices, on some of the arguments that we shouldn't use, and it's kind of these sensational 
things that may or may not actually be true, but so many people, when they talk about this subject, they focus so much on, hey, well, these giant skeletons were found in America back in the 1800s or all these, you know, they come up with all these different things. And I think, you know what, why don't we just see what the Bible says on this topic? And so that was really my goal in this book, not to, uh, you know, I, if we find a giant skeleton, that won't shock me because I think there were giants, but I'm not basing my view on this, on that topic. It's, it's what does scripture teach? Do you think the aliens are angels? Yeah, that, that answer was not satisfying. I want I, to know about the I aliens. I need to know about the lights <laughs> in the sky, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> um, here's what I, would say. I, I think two. that... Uh, yeah, part two. I think that there are, I think most of the time there's the UFO kind of stuff is just a, you know, stuff that people just don't recognize what it is. And it's just some, some natural thing. I think there is such a thing as demonic deception. I think in certain cases, that's probably what's taking place. But um, yeah, I, is that good enough? Yeah, that, that'll do. That'll do. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Miller, you got any follow-up questions, buddy? Or we need to wrap it. Oh, uh, no, no follow-up. It's just fun cool. to talk about this stuff. No, it's a blast. Tim, you did a fantastic job. Enjoyed your book. Great interview. Thank you so much for coming on. You guys can go watch an episode we did with Tim back in the day. Uh, hit the subscribe button, like the video. There's hundreds of, hundreds of you guys watching right now. You guys love yourself some Nephilims and Angels. I'll tell you what. Uh, subscribe <laughs> to the channel. Hit the like video. We come out with content like this all the time. Uh, and uh, Tim, thanks again. Where do people pick up your book, man? Like, where, Where's the best place to get it? Yeah, I was glad you asked that question. I was going to say, you got to go buy it. It's Fallen, Sons of God and the Nephilim. Uh, almost 500 pages, so you can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can get it on my website, which is risenmin.com, which is short for Risen Ministries. Uh, so you can get it there. And um, let's see, yeah, you, and other places as well that you can find online. But those would be the two primary spots. Fantastic. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. If you want more content like that, hit the subscribe button. We're crowdfunded, so there are links in the description if you would like to give a one-time gift on PayPal, uh, or you can choose to be a recurring giver on Patreon. And if you give uh, on Patreon as low as five bucks a month, you'll get access to extra content. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this program, and we will see you next time.